Hello, I'm happy that all of you joined. My name is Helge Simon, and in today's live, uh, we will take a deeper dive into Hello, visualizing. I'm happy that all of you joined. My name is Helge Simon. Oh, wow. Well. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I'm happy that um, all of you joined. And in today's live, we're going to take a deeper dive into visualizing NVMIT uh, model outputs in QJS. Uh, the demo is split into two sections uh, first, a theoretical description, and second, a hands on in our QGIS plugin. As uh, in all of our, our lives, uh, feel free to ask uh, questions along the way, and we will get back to them at a later stage. So let's start with some theory. So as many of you are um, familiar, I guess, um, we recently uh, developed the QGIS plugin. And uh, for those of you who are not too familiar with it, um, the QGIS plugin um, is basically a plugin to the program, free and open source program, Quantum Geographic Information System, short QGIS. It is one of the most powerful QGISs or GISs, if not the most powerful. And uh, it has countless tools to manage and edit, analyze, and visualize geodata. And the QGIS plugin is capable of, yeah, taking all this information, geodata information, off terrain, vegetation, buildings, surfaces, and much more, and then converting it to NVMIT. And when I say converting it, it doesn't stop there. Actually, when you first, you obviously can create model areas based on publicly available geodata, or can edit geodata yourself. And this can be, in the left here, you see, for example, a very large section of uh, New York City. Or on the right hand side, you see um, San Francisco. And based on this geodata, you can then uh, place a sub area inside this model domain and export this to NVMet. And it, then after you uh, created your model area, you can also start NVMet simulations. So you can set up your um, simulation file. You can define the boundary conditions, um, define when the simulations should take place and how long uh, the simulation should run for. And then the animate simulation can be started outside of QGIS. Of course, both of the programs have to be installed on the PC, animate as well as Q QGIS. And lastly, and this is what we're going to talk about today, is the visualization of NVMet model outputs within QGIS. And these can be rather large outputs. And as you see here, they can be on um, their georeference, so they are the exact location where the simulation took place. And uh, they can be overlaying, uh, they can overlay satellite images or any other geodata that is available. You can also create maps with uh, 2.5D uh, buildings, for example, or any other um, data that you imported. And we're going to talk about this uh, and, and show it live in a second. If you have, haven't uh, had the uh, opportunity to look at the um, uh, look at the plugin yet, there's a YouTube playlist, and I will post the uh, link in the comment section in a second. And um, yeah, feel free to, to watch this three-part series where we go a bit deeper into the three steps. This would be creating a model area, starting a simulation, also uh, very short and briefly visualizing the outputs. And today we're gonna just focus on this and, and see what's possible there. So just for um, out of curiosity, um, are there any uh, one? Is there anyone who already used the uh, QGIS plugin? So feel free to uh, write it in the comments. I'm very eager and interested if you already checked it out um, and if you're familiar with it. I'll take a look at it in a second then. Okay. Um, so speaking about the different possibilities to visualize NVMet outputs, obviously there is the possibility to uh, look at outputs in Leonardo, which would be the classical tool to take a look at outputs. So this is, I guess, uh, familiar to you. So I can start Leonardo and typically, oh, let's wait and when it's loaded. So now that it's loaded, um, this would be the classical way to visualize outputs. And while it's been loading, I see, yeah, some of you already used it. Ah, I'm very happy that and that uh, some of you already used it and are quite happy with it. Um, so cool. And I hope that I can show you some some more details uh, of it today. Nevertheless, 
So this would be a Leonardo. And in Leonardo, obviously, you can always take a look at outputs. For example, I have a simulation output here uh, in the city of Mainz. And I take a look at the PET, maybe of 1500. And once I selected the data, I can go to, for example, say, let's see, look at the PET at the biometric, uh, bioclimatic height of 1.4 meters and extract the output. And this would be, I guess, very familiar to all, most or all of you, how these output looks. Yeah, And they are, of course, great because you get a map. You already get the information, OK, where, where was north in this, uh, in this map? You get the scale. You can arrange the scale differently. All this different uh, information you have, you can extract uh, single cells in cell information and also go to 3D. So this would be the general way to, to handle NVIDIA outputs, but um, there are others. And one, one more would be uh, that is not QGIS, would be using Python scripts. So if you're familiar with, for example, um, NetCDF outputs, there's only a couple of lines of code. Maybe we'll do a live about it. Um, then uh, this could be, uh, if you're familiar with it, um, then um, yeah, then it's quite easy to do. And um, if not, maybe we'll do a live about it in the future um, too. So you can just load the NetCDF data and create a map looking like this. Yeah, For example, here, this is Berlin. This is the Tiergarten and the um, Brandenburg Gate. Um, museum, island, Alexander Place, etc., and um, yeah, the scale too, and it doesn't stop there. You can also have a look at different uh, model outputs directly from Python. If, for example, you use or you choose to use the output of NetCDF, but today I want to take you to a third option, and this would be, uh, like I said before, QGIS. And for that, um, you obviously have to install QGIS from their website, um, QGIS.org. And then you start to install the plugin. You go to the plugin selector, and the plugin selector, um, obviously, you just oh, uninstall the plugin right now so that we are that we can install it again together. So we go to not installed or all and type envy hyphen net, and this will be the only one available. available. And uh, here is geodata to envy net, and we install the plugin. And once it's installed, we get this button up here. And this button up here enables us to, to get the, to this screen. And like I said before in the um, quick introduction, um, we are able to export geodata. And this is something that I saw um, uh, that some of the people uh, here live here today are, are typically using. So exporting geodata to create any model areas. Like I said, you can also create the simulation, start the simulation, but this tab is the one uh, that we're most interested um, in today. And we can select model output file. And for example, I have an output file here in uh, Berlin Schönhauser Allee. Um, and let's again, maybe take a bioclimatic output of the PET um, of why not 1400. So it will be quite quite hot, uh, the thermal index. I select the variable to load. So here I select the, the file. I can also select multiple files. Um, why not do this? Yeah. I select multiple files. So I want to load all the outputs from 1,400, 1,500, 1,600, 1,700, and 1,800. And the variable I want to load would be PET. I want to load it at a specific height, 1.4. This should look quite familiar to, to you. It's very similar to the um, loading from and to the extracting from uh, 2D maps for Leonardo. Then I load the data. And now I have three loading options. So this is just loading the data into to memory. And now to add it to the map, I have three, three options. I can load the data and do not apply a rotation and interpolation. I can load the data and rotate the data, but not perform an interpolation. And I can rotate the data uh, interpolated. Um, and this would be the, the, the default option. So um, the fastest me method would be just loading it, and um, it will not be rotated. Uh, but if you want to have a georeferenced information, then obviously you should 
uh, choose the the load and rotate interpolate, interpolate, interpolate the data and it doesn't take very long you, you see that uh, this is a rather large model area file and nevertheless it, it loaded quite quickly okay now we have the three or was it more it's even five uh, the five outputs so if you imagine loading five outputs in leonardo is not faster it's actually um, a bit slower um, and we have these as layers added to uh, to qgs and these are not specific layers or any specific um, type of data they are just raster data like normal raster data in qgs and you can do everything um, that you want to do with with raster, da raster data in general so first off um, maybe we just look at one maybe at the 1400 and we double click it and we get to the layer property options and it is a um, the type of visualization so in the symbology we can change the way it should appear to on the screen and if we want to not have a gray image just going from from black to white um, we can say okay let's uh, do a pseudo color image and then for the pseudo color i can uh, choose a color ramp and the color ramp uh, you have lots of them available yeah let's for now just uh, select this one and apply it and then you will see okay it already looks much nicer you see that uh, in the pet obviously um, you have the information about uh, the shades where the plants or the trees cast a shade and um, these temperature um, appear to be lower in the pet and then you have the um, the walls that are orientated towards the sun at 1400 and you see higher um, pet values at, at these uh, uh, cells and of course the building they buildings they cast the shade but since this is a uh, geodata it um yeah you can also uh, load background information to them so you can use um, the quick map services of qjs and maybe load the google satellite image in the background yeah so now you have the google uh, satellite image in the background and on top of it you have the the geodata um yeah maybe the, the color ramp isn't too nice typical color lamps that that i tend to use are um for for temperature values like the pet would be maybe the um the turbo color range and then yeah can also play with the transp uh, trans transparency so they can you can see uh, the different types of surfaces um through the um through the climate output data or and this is very, quite ha um, handy is you can um create new color ramps and use the C cpt city catalog and this is installed with qgis and once it's loaded yeah, here um, you see that there is different uh, palettes for example for for temperature this is a quite often used uh, used palette uh, 19 steps of temperature from a dark blue to a white to a dark red and uh, this is a quite nice looking color ramp that, that visualizes um, yeah, differences in, in heat intensity quite nicely i think um, once you have uh, loaded this uh, this information you can what you can do actually is uh, copy this style and select all the other outputs and paste the style to them too so now that uh, i have this style you see the color ramp here and the other ones were gray before but now i, I pasted them to the other uh, color output so now we see 1400 1500 you can see the color ramp Oop, the color ramp is the same and when i enable and disable then you see that the shadows get longer obviously because it's getting later in the day and at 1600 getting even uh, longer the shades and you you see cooler temperatures um and yeah 1700 1800 and the sun is more or less going down um, and have a, has a very um, uh, yeah, low angle, thus the, the shades are getting longer. And now because I copied the, um, the color ramp from the 1400 and, and placed it on top of them, the value range is the same. So you can directly interpret the different colors as the same temperatures. This is a quite handy feature, so you don't have to um yeah play around with the um the symbology all the time in order to fit the min and max values 
obviously um the the min value of uh, 1800 might be below um 33 degrees um so let's see if i select it again no actually it isn't um so that's uh, that's quite good um but if I want to stretch the information here, oh, it is, sorry, it is. It wasn't updated. Um, so it is. It goes from twenty-seven to to fifty-nine, uh, fifty-eight point nine degrees. So uh, if I want to stretch it to this scale, um, then uh, I can update it by clicking classify. Yeah. So in the single band pseudo color, um, I can uh, use the classify uh, option here. And if I want to have an equal interval, I can also select that here. And then say, okay, let's. I want to go from, for example, let's say I want to go from 27 degrees to uh, 57. This would be 30 degrees. Yeah, and then I add 30 classes so that each color resembles 31, obviously, because they both count. Yeah. Um, so from 27 to 57 is obviously 31 classes. So each color resembles one degree centigrade. I update it and I enable it. And then you see that we now have um, yeah, a discrete pattern where each color is uh, set to one degree centigrade distances. Um, now that these are all simply raster values, we have the possibility to use all the different tools that come with QJS. And this is quite nice because um, what we can do is now this is a resolution we can check. You see that these pixel values they yeah look pixely because uh, it is a simulation that I ran with. Um, let's measure that I ran with three and a half meters or three meters. It's three meters, yeah, uh, three meters of uh, cell dimension. Yeah, so it's three by three meters, and if I, um, yeah, in order to save computational time. And what I can do is I can um, say, let's uh, recalculate, let's um, interpolate these values to get a finer grid. Obviously, it's not the same as simulating in a one meter grid, for example, but in order for, the, for it to look nicer, you can, for example, say, let's have this raster and recalculate this raster to uh, resample it basically to a different uh, resolution. And for that, because it is just a raster, we have all the different tools that come with QGIS. If you're not too familiar um, uh, with it, uh, with QGIS and the thousands of tools, I mean, I can just quickly click here and you see just the, the raster calculation tools. Yeah, um, it's yeah. crazy how many tools there are. These are just the, the QGIS tools, then there are the uh, GDAL tools. There are a lot, a lot, um, a lot of them. Um, there is so many learning material out there for QGIS, and the, the community is quite large, even larger than um, the microclimate uh, community. And so uh, you can access all this information quite quickly and easily um, by just uh, yeah typing into Google, OK, I have a raster, and I want to have a different resolution of the raster. Uh, Google will tell you, or the Google results will tell you, OK, I should use warp. Yeah, and warp would um, be a raster projection where I can reproject this raster. So double click it, double clicking it will uh, give me this um, uh, this dialog, and I can select okay which raster do I want to recalculate. So let's just say I want to recalculate the fourteen hundred, and the coordinate reference system. Um, I can set it here, but if I don't uh, add it uh, add it here. It will be the same as the input raster, and since this is already in georeferenced um, in a georeferenced coordinate reference system, I don't have to change it at all. And the target, so the the output, will be in again the same if I don't change anything. So this is an optional output. And now important is the resampling method. Resampling would be the information. Okay, if I, for example, um, Say okay, this is a three by three three grid, and the new data set should be a one by one grid. Which value should the new? Because then obviously there will be more grid cells. Uh, which uh, values should these new grid cells uh, get? And if I select it nearest neighbor, then they would get the value of their nearest neighbor in the in the uh, source uh, grid. This would not give me any better results. But if I, for example, say, okay, let's give it a bilinear um, resampling method, 
Um, then I simply said, okay, the target resolution should be one meter. So this is always in the unit um, from the from the target resolution. And since all geodata that comes from QGIS will always be in a metric um, resolution, this would be then uh, in this case one meter. And then I uh, simply say, okay, I want to have a, the output as a temporary file. I can also write it to my hard drive directly. Um, yeah, let's make a new folder and save it here. This would be uh, PET 14H resample one by one, one by one meter. Yeah, I say save, and if I click run, then it will resample this data. Resample this data, and even in the grayscale data, you see that these grid cells are much finer. Yeah, so these are now one by one meter. And I, like I said before, it's it is not the same as if you simulated a one by one. It it just makes the the output look more please, pleasing. But in most cases, um, since you don't get much more information simulating a two by two or a three by three or something like this, um, there is no harm in um, yeah interpolating, also reprojecting this data. Um, it just looks nicer. Um, then we can color ramp this again as a pseudo color. And now we have a final looking resolution of the uh, original input data that came in three by three. So this would be um, interpolating with uh, with the warp function of QGIS. And um, what I can do is obviously, for example, make ISO lines. They are always a great tool too, to take a look at, um, yeah, to, to mapping out um, areas that, that carry the same value. And uh, since, like I said, it's a typical raster value, we uh, raster um, format our opus, we can do the, um, we can use all the different raster tools up here too. And one of them might be that we want to take is the extraction and then the contour lines. So I have the PET of 1400 resampled one by one meter. And now I say, okay, for every, this would be the value um, the, of the uh, parameter. So every one degree centigrade, we want to uh, we want it to to draw a um, an ISO line, and the attribute of the ISO line because it's going to be uh, obviously a vector information. We can say okay, it should carry the information of PET. I say run. And since it's a one by one raster now, it takes a bit of longer time. If I uh, was doing it by uh, for three by three, uh, it would obviously go faster. And now I have a new layer here called contours. And again, I can go to the symbology and maybe make it a black contour. And then I see, okay, they are where the ISO lines are close together. We have a high gradient, so we have changing the the PET values are changing quite quickly over the, over the horizontal distance. So we have a large gradient from the shaded area here. Inside the shaded area, there's not a large gradient, but stepping out of the shaded area into the sunlight, we have a high gradient in the PET values and values. And this is obviously something that yeah, we all know from, um, from our experience when we are walking in the shade and then um, we are stepping out. And obviously this is the static PET. So we are standing in the shade, I should say. And then we go one step um, out into the sunlight, and then we stand there for um, for a considerable amount of time because, like I said, it's the static PET. Then I will feel hot. Yeah. So the gradient here in the uh, PET is quite large, and um, on inside the street here, um, it is obviously like inside the shade. It's not that large. So this would be another option that I have um, with QJS because it's just raster data. Obviously, the ISO lines is just one way to um, recalculate this information. We can also polygonize the um, the raster pixels in order to to look at the raster um, in, in a, or to, to look at the to convert the raster into a vector file um, directly. Um, this could be done in conversion uh, polygonize. Yeah, so then you would end up with uh, every grid cell of the model output resampled or not, yeah, one by one or 
three by three as the original would be then uh, one of the polygons. And these polygons would then, um, uh, yeah, you could alter them, obviously. You could select them um, or um, cut the area to, to your um, domain, to your uh, needs, um, like, like you can do, obviously, in the raster, too. Um, one feature that is quite often, that we do quite often in uh, Leonardo um, is that we compare two different outputs. So, for example, um, let's say I have uh, 24 hours simulated. Typically, we have two simulations. We have one simulation of the status quo, and then maybe we change something. So, in this model area, let's say um, we um, see that uh, here in this, this street here, there are no trees. Um, between um, uh, for starting from here going to the south uh, west and uh, so we have a higher PET values in this area and maybe in a redesign we would add some trees and then we would take a look at a difference map this is something that that we do quite often in Leonardo and we can do the same in um, in QGIS 2 um, right now, I only have one simulation file, but another um, interesting uh, difference map is always taking a look, look at the PET values at different times. So, for example, I could look at the PET value at um, the time of highest solar um, radiation. This would be around noon and the time of highest air temperature. This is typically um, 1400, um, 16. Um, um, uh, so 4, 4 p.m., 1600 um, uh, in the afternoon. So let's load the 12 o'clock um, data into, uh, into this um, project too. So again, I go to the output folder and select the PET output at 12. So again, the... I selected the output file. I selected the variable to load. I tell it where in which height should I um, should it be loaded. I load the data and I add the data to the map. And the data is now here. So let's go back back there. So this would be the data at uh, twelve o'clock. So let's do it pseudo color again. Yeah. So this would be the data at twelve o'clock. So this would be the time. Um, where the air temperature, or where the solar radiation is highest. So the PET, as many of you do, as probably all of you know, consists out of the mean radiant temperature, the air temperature, the wind speed, and the um, relative humidity. And since uh, at daytime the uh, mean radiant temperature is the most dominant um, parameter, uh, we are taking a look at 12 o'clock, where the solar radiation is at its maximum, and compare it to the simulation output at 1600, where the air temperature is highest. And we can compare it, obviously, if we put the, um, if we, uh, so again, copy the style and paste it to 12, and now we have the same style again. Now, so now I can compare it visually, but it's hard to, to understand because, um, um, or how to, to guess which values are in these cells actually. Obviously, I can get the info button and I see, okay, in this cell here, I have 42 uh, degrees at 12 o'clock. And in this cell, I have 35 degrees at 1600. But if I want to take, uh, if I only want to take um, a look at the difference values, not the two absolute values, I can again use the raster calculator. And the raster calculator gives me the option then to, um, yeah, look at the difference or to calculate the difference between 1600 minus 1200 and um, the resulting so it takes all the cell values of 1600s and for the con and, and uh, subtracts the corresponding cells at 1200 from it and it will then create a new raster value and um, this one I'll save well, I don't remember which folder it was I just create a new folder again um, to if PET 16, 16 minus 12. And um, yeah, it should have the same uh, output coordinate reference system. So that is again uh, geo referenced here. And this would be now my difference map. And in the difference map, you see that the values. They go from minus 21 degrees centigrade 
up to plus 25 degrees centigrade. So what does it mean? So positive values mean that at 1600, we have a higher value and negative values because we calculated um, 16 minus 12 and negative values would mean um, that we have um, cooler temperatures at 1600. So the radiation uh, has uh, less of an effect as the air temperature. And we can again uh, use the, the pseudo color range and maybe because it's a, um, we want to have a standard as a standard typically uh, when you're looking at uh, differences, difference maps, you want to have the values that are close to zero and the color of white. So that uh, white means no change. So let's select a color ramp where um, this is the case. So again, the color ramp of CPT City is uh, the color is has one of the color ramps, and this would be the temperature 19 value. So you see that white is in the middle, and if I select equal interval, I can then uh, say, okay, let's cut the values from um, 15 to um, uh, minus 15, sorry, from minus 15 to uh, plus 15. So this would be 31 steps. Go up. Oh, 31 steps. So now again, each color um, corresponds to uh, corresponds to one degree centigrade. In the middle, we have the, the values that are close to zero. And this would result then in this map. So now uh, you see the differences are in PET between 1600 and 1200. And if I use the information button here, we see here the, the number, um, how great the difference is. So this would be 13 degrees, obviously, because I cut the, um, because I limited the, the legend from minus 15 to plus 15. Some of them are very darkish red, and these are the ones that fall outside um, the, the, the color range that I selected. Um, okay, before I um, go a bit further, maybe we I'll quickly take a look at the Q&As. Uh, dear, I get this button also made doors to push end results to new level. I see that for a proper input, the correct projection in the EX is crucial. Could you show how this can be done correctly? Yes, uh, this is absolutely great. Uh, absolutely right. The um, In order to be able to yeah, load the data in the correct location, it is of utmost importance that the um, uh, model before it was run, the model area, was located in the right place. And one of the ways to ensure that is to use the QGIS plugin to um, create the model area because then it will automatically be in the right location. So um, I can maybe I can demonstrate that here uh, and load the information of the geodata of the building. So what I did to create this model area, I loaded the, um, these are the buildings that I downloaded from the city of Berlin and I cut them to the model area. Obviously, there are a lot of buildings, yeah. Um, and uh, in order to have a smaller data set, I, I cut it uh, only to the um, area that I was interested in. And uh, when I then imported or created my model area, I uh, used the export GIS layer to EnvyMet. And if I select the Schönhauser, the buildings of this layer, and yeah, for example, the height, um, then it will automatically know where it is. And uh, this, you can also look at this when you look at the simulation results that this is the case. So in the simulation results, there's always two files for each hour. So for six o'clock, there is one uh, file called EDX and one, this is a descriptive file. And then there is a, another file called EDT and this is the binary file where the actual data is stored. So this is also the reason why they are so different in size. And um, if I look at the data here, um, you see that this um, section of the tags, yeah, I just opened the EDX file in my um, in a text editor. Um, you see the model description, uh, it is filled and it is filled correctly. So it's basically this information. So it, the UTMs, UTM zone would be 33. The georeference of the lower left corner would be the, the value of uh, 392229. Uh, for the x coordinate and for the y coordinate, it would be this value, and um, the model rotation is obviously important. 
And uh, based on this data, the plugin knows where to place the um, and how to project the model output. If you created your um, model input files um, with uh, spaces, you can obviously fill obviously fill this data too. Yeah, uh, you have to fill this information in in the um, in the INX file. It is if you didn't have this information, if you created it from somewhere else, you know, model input file and did a simulation, and this information would not be um, included in, in the EDX file, the plugin will still be able to load the data, but it would not know where to place it. So it would be placed at zero, zero, so close to the equator in the, um, yeah, just uh, before Africa. Yeah? So it would be at zero, zero. So I don't zoom in there right now. Um, and it would not be correctly placed. What you can, of course, do then is, um, uh, yeah, relocate um, the the uh, raster and rotate it to the place where it actually is. Yes, yeah? so, so this would be a georeferencing. Um, I won't have time to go into a detail about the georeferencing in in this live demo. But if you um, Google uh, how to georeference raster information in QJS, you will get, um, there's so much learning material out there, you will get the information how to do this and place your model output exactly at the right uh, place on Earth. Yeah, okay, the next question is basically, I, I just answered it. So if you created the INX using Monde, the geolocation will be um, the same. Yes, uh, it depends if you, um, which coordinate reference system you use. I mean, the easiest way is to, to just quickly double check that these values are filled, yeah? So that the model description, especially that these values here are filled, yeah? These give you the information of where is the model area located on Earth. And um, then it will be able to uh, to, to place the, 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 the simulation outputs at the right, right place. Uh, ah, hi, Anya. Um, I did actually create my model area using QGIS plugin and just looked the results in the same project, but it's still not in the correct place. Any tips how to get it in the right place? Mm, I have the suspicion that maybe your um, your location of the model area input files, so when creating the model areas, they might not have been in a uh, in the correct projected coordinate system, or maybe in the same coordinate project system. Because if, for example, the buildings are in uh, UTM and the surfaces are in a different coordinate system and the vegetation is again in a different coordinate system, and then the sub area is in a fourth <laughs> coordinate system, then it there might be some discrepancies um, on, of, on where to locate it. Um, this might be the reason for it. Um, so the preferred way would be the UTM. So to use the um, universal uh, transverse Mercator um, map projection system. So I suspect this would, might be the reason. Um, the plot was amazing, but cannot we plot the legend also, or is it post-processing? Yes, uh, the legend can be plotted too. So right now I, I'm, uh, I was just showing you um, the uh, yeah the data processing on, on how to um, uh, look at the data, but obviously um, the uh, importing the legend is possible when you create once you create a map, and um, I can quickly do this here. So um, you can uh, add a map, so basically a print layout uh, here to your map. And this would be your print layout. And in the print layout, um, again, I will just cover this very briefly because there is uh, very good tutorials out there. You add the map. So here is a map. And then you will also add, you can also add a, um, a scale to it, yeah. Um, and you can add a north arrow, arrow and um, also the legend. So. Here is the legend, and uh, obviously because we have lots of data um, right now in the project, uh, you can also get the information about the different legends and about the yeah have the legends next to the actual values. So um, 
This is just very briefly how to create a layout in QGIS. We will have to, or I um, recommend, yeah, looking at some, um, yeah, some some tutorials on how to make this uh, prettier. <laughs> I mean, it's not much difficult. It's not difficult to make this prettier. Um, model outputs that were created with terrain. Yes, um, there you're right. In Leonardo, this is not a model area with terrain, but if there was terrain in this model area in Leonardo, you would get the information, okay, what do you want to do? Do you want to take a look at the model outputs using a flat cut, which means, okay, just one meter below the, uh, above the lowest grid cell, and then most of the grid cells would be inside your, uh, inside your terrain. And then you have the option, okay, let's always take a look at the, all the atmosphere um, cells one meter above the terrain. So this would be terrain following. And, and here in this plugin here, in the QJS plugin, you do not have oh, sorry, you do not have the option, but or because it will always be above the terrain. So this is the, why the the option is not here, because um, I, I thought um, when I developed it um, that uh, yeah it wouldn't make much sense if if you're creating a large model domain you will have some elevation in there if if you choose so uh, to include it and then it will always be the cut will always be uh, 1.4 meters or depending on your resolution obviously above the terrain. So it is always terrain following. Yeah. Um, the results we need without a buffer zone between the building and the edge of the model. How can we do that? Um, yeah, um, here, uh, if they don't look nice, maybe then it's good to add a bit of buffer zone. So actually there is a buffer zone. So if you uh, look at the buildings here. This would be the vectors. So the, the these um yeah these orange I'd say uh, colored structures are the buildings, and uh, you see that the if I enable and disable them that here you ha we have um, output data. So the plugin if uh, you create the model area out of the plugin it has the default option to delete some of the building, uh, some of the cells that are close to the border. And the default option would be clear building cells close to the model border. And the um, value that is given here is in grid cells. So this would, when I created this model area before I simulated it, um, yeah, cut out five grid cells, or I can adjust it obviously, cut out this number of um, grid cells close to the border uh, in order to um, yeah, to, to receive nice looking borders, yeah. But of course, you can also uh, cut and reduce the, um, the the raster. This is not a problem at all. So if you um, only want to take a look at part of the raster, you can use the uh, extraction and clip raster by extend and uh, yeah, draw here and say, okay, just this uh, square, I want to um, take a closer look uh, uh, on. And um, yeah, thanks for all your support. I had the same problem from getting the results mapped in the class. It only works well with vertical rectangle. If I turned rectangle, the results draw out of place. And they are the same word system. And uh, yeah, so maybe you have the, I because um, you have the problem, if I understood your question correctly, that they turned in the right, they, they, they were not in the right place when the model area was out of north. Yeah, so it was not aligning to, to, uh, to a north, uh, north cardinal direction. And the reason for it is, I, I suggest, um, that you might have been using, yes, the same coordinate reference system for all the different, um, for all the different layers, but maybe not um, um, a projection. So you can, for example, use the uh, geographic coordinate system for all the layers, but then uh, yeah, uh, rotating the model area will be different. Will be uh, different for each cell, and there I suspect uh, the inaccuracies came into place. So I really recommend using the UTM. Um, this is basically the world standard, and it always the best results, I guess, will be with WGS84, and then your UTM zone that corresponds to the place where the model area is located. For example, here in Berlin, it would be UTM zone um, 33 north, 33N. Yeah. So this basically. Yeah. So I su suggest this is the reason um, 
for it not being in the in the right place. Um, so uh, while there are no other questions, maybe I can show you one more thing that I think is quite quite nice, because you can obviously look at the model results here. Um, but maybe you want to share these model results with somebody else who is not using QJS. So I, in order to have a bit more overview here, um, I remove some of the model results. So I only have um, these here now. So I have the um, PET value, the resample value of one by one meter, and I have the buildings. And maybe I want to draw the buildings, which I like uh, quite a lot, is having the 2.5D buildings so that they uh, yeah, look three-dimensional, basically. I, as the height value, I set the, uh, the, where the, the, the field where the height is stored. And now you see that QGIS renders the, the buildings three-dimensionally. And now you get some, uh, some, yeah, some more nice-looking nice uh, pictures. But maybe you want to share this map to somebody who does not have QGIS. And uh, one very easy and nice uh, way to do this is by creating a so-called web map. Yeah, And a web map um, can, be, um, uh, can be done uh, by using another plugin. Um, and this plugin is uh, called, let me see, uh, the plugin that uh, I use for that is the QGIS to web. Yeah, this is a, a very easy to to use um, plugin in order to create a web map that can be shared um, with people who do not have QGIS installed and any or anything, and it can be viewed in a browser, not just on a PC but also on a smartphone or a tablet and any anything. And um, this can be done by installing this plugin that I just said, QGIS to a web, and then I say create, create a web map. And I typically use leaflet. And um, you first select, OK, which layers should be included into the web map. So let's say I want to have the buildings. Um, yeah, why not the contours too? This were the, you remember the contours uh, that we entered before. And the PET values at uh, 1,400 in a one by one, and maybe also the, the Google Satellite pictures. You can change the um, experience, uh, the the appearance here. Um, maybe I add a layer list. This means you will see what that means in a second. And you can also, yeah, use a geolocate user. So if the user is looking at this map on his smart or his or her smartphone, then it will um, also show his location relative to the uh, model results. This is one possibility. You can add a measurement tool in, in metric or imperial. Um, and stuff like that. So I don't want to get into detail with all of these options. I just press export. And uh, it is now creating a website, um, this website, where I have first, this is the different layers that I can select and deselect. Yeah? And, and you see, I can have the, I have the whole Google satellite. Yeah? And within this Google satellite map, I have the building as a 2.5D model. I have the uh, the contour lines. I can enable and disable them. I can uh, yeah get the color images from the raster, and um, I can also yeah create a measurement. Yeah, so I can say okay how I don't know how big is the distance from here to there, and it will give me 33 meters. Yeah, and where is this point? Um, and this can easily be shared because it's just uh, it's just a document on your PC uh, you can select where it's stored where it's stored um, and sh can share this uh, document to to anybody and or maybe upload it on your website and everybody can uh, look at these um, without having to install QGIS or Animat or anything yeah so um, this is a very easy way to share the information using a browser with with others with third uh, th three third people and uh, and maybe clients um, are there any other questions? Oh, yeah. Javier, I see that uh, you use the ETRS uh, 89 system. Yes, I, I, I think that might be the reason. Um, maybe double check on that. Um, this, this, this could be the reason. Um, actually, it should also work with ETRS 89, but um, 
I, I suspect that might be the reason. I'm not 100% sure, um, but you can check back on that. Are there any other questions? If not, then uh, maybe I can share the link again. Uh, share it in the commentary. And the link I um, just shared would be up oh, would be uh, head would head you to the uh, NVMe QGIS plugin, and it is a playlist where we were now talking about just the last part of the last video, and the, this video was the the, the shortest one. So uh, in this series, we really go into depth about all the different steps that um, you can you can take in order to simulate or to create a model area, to set up your simulation, to set up your project folder, actually even your data organization, how to um, yeah, create different database items and your model areas based on publicly available geodata. I think the, um, the example um, that I did here was in New York City. Um, then uh, the simulation is run in the third video, and every very brief uh, information was only about the visualization, which was the reason why I wanted to get a bit more into detail in the live demo of today. Um, since I see that there is, um, <laughs> since I see that there are no uh, other questions, and also from my side, uh, happy Pi Day here, yeah? <laughs> uh, March fourteenth. Uh, I thank you very much for um, your attention. And uh, yeah, feel free to reach out if you have any question recommendations about further um, yeah, enhancing this uh, plugin. And um, I'm happy that uh, many people are, are using it and finding it useful. Thank you very much, and uh, see you next time. Bye.